please join me in welcoming Michael Bergdahl. You know, a friend of mine was successful in growing his business to the point that he needed to open up in a new location. So being the good friend that I am, I went ahead and sent my friend some flowers for his new grand opening. And then I decided to show up that Saturday morning for the ribbon cutting ceremony. Well, I walk in the door and my friend says to me, Mike, what's the story on these flowers? And he takes me over to this display of flowers and emblazoned across the flowers. It says, rest in peace. And I'm taken back for just a moment and I think to myself and then I say out loud, if it's any consolation, there's somebody somewhere, someplace in town today being buried under a display of flowers that says, good luck in your new location. <laughs> How many of you run a, uh, an independent convenience store? Could I see a show of hands? How many of you uh, run a, uh, a store that a directly owned a store for a con for one of the oil companies? And how many of you work for a chain of convenience stores? We've got a good distribution. You know that there's nothing these big box retailers would like better than to send you that display of flowers for your business that says rest in peace. But it's my goal and my job here today, having had the invitation to come here to speak with you this morning, to give you some ideas, some tips, some tricks that you can use for your business that will ensure that you receive that display of flowers for your business that says good luck in your new location. My name is Mike Bergdahl, and a funny thing happened to me with respect to my name. I had the chance to go to Bentonville, Arkansas. Anybody been up to the Ozark Mountains to Bentonville? We've got a few people that have been up there. How many of you are ready to move there tomorrow? I don't see a lot of hands. Well, I was living in North Dallas at the time, and I was working for a company that all of you are familiar with, Frito-Lay. And I went up to interview on a Saturday morning in Bentonville, and to be honest with you, I was more flattered by the opportunity to go there to meet with their executives then I was actually really interested in taking a job if it was offered. But I interviewed with a cast of thousands. You know how companies do that when they interview people? They try to throw bodies at the problem and wear the recruit out. I interviewed with the chief merchandising officer, the head of human resources, and the, and the chief operating officer. And at the end of this interview with the COO, I noticed he was looking over my shoulder behind me into the doorway. So naturally, I followed his glance back and there was an old man standing in the doorway, and for just a moment I thought it was the janitor coming in to pick up the trash that Saturday morning. And then it hit me, this is Sam Walton. And Sam Walton comes walking into my interview, and I got introduced to him by the COO who used this eloquent southern accent. He says, Mr. Sam, this is Mike Birdall. And Sam looked at me with the strangest look on his face, and he says, bird dog, as in B-I-R-D-D-A-W-G, bird dog. And for just a moment, I didn't know whether that was a good thing or a bad thing to be referred to as bird dog by Sam Walton. But if any of you have had the opportunity to know the Walmart story or read his autobiography, you'd know that Sam was a prolific bird hunter and he owned a pack of hunting dogs. And you know how some of you have that practice called bring your child to work day? Sam had a practice called bring your dog to work day. And he'd bring his dogs to the headquarters, a whole pack of hunting dogs, and set them loose in the halls of a fortune number one company headquarters. And those dogs would run the halls, and you'd see the security guards running behind them with dustpans and mops and brooms, cleaning up behind what dogs do. So in that moment, when I was introduced to Sam Walton as bird dog, I had become instantaneously endeared to the most successful merchant in the history of the world. I decided as a result of those experiences, first I did go to work for Walmart. I was so uh, taken by the fact that I had a chance to meet Sam Walton 
and I knew I was going to get the chance to work with him uh, while I was in the headquarters. So I went to Walmart. And I'll be the first to tell you, I never planned to write a book about the experience. It wasn't like I went there thinking, oh boy, I'm going to go there and I'm going to learn all these great things and then I'm going to write this book. What happened to me was interesting. When I left the company, I went into uh, turnarounds. And because of my experience at Walmart, I became a turnaround specialist. And what I ended up doing is I went to a company called American Eagle Outfitters, a specialty apparel retailer. Do any of you have teenage kids? If you have teenage kids, you probably know American Eagle Outfitters. And I joined that company, and when I did, it was in the ditch with the wheels off. And the company that owned American Eagle was considering liquidation at the time. And we were successful in turning the company around. We took it public. And after I was there for nine years, we ended up having a, a, a total of four stock splits following our IPO. So we were wildly successful. I then went on to a turnaround in a, in, a, in a different industry called Waste Management, the trash company. And my point in telling you about my turnaround experiences is this. I found myself using the knowledge that I gained at Walmart over and over and over again in my experiences in other companies. I didn't ask earlier, but I'll ask now, how many of you are suppliers to convenience stores? We have, any, we have some suppliers out here. I wrote this book for retailers, manufacturers, suppliers, and interestingly enough, non-retailers. And I wrote it with an outside-in approach. Uh, when I wrote the book, I decided that I, I wanted to try to figure out some ideas that I had gleaned from my experiences at Walmart and subsequent to working at Walmart. So what I did is I interviewed executives that were out there in the industry from pharmacies, the grocery store industry, and the convenience store industry. And one of the first things I did is I contacted your, uh, your NAX association and asked for referrals of people that I could talk to. And they gave me the names of three of the, uh, uh, the big chain operators, Steve Sheets, Dick Wood, and Chester Caggio. And these individuals were nice enough to provide, provide me with some terrific insights into the issues around Walmart and convenience stores today. Much of what they told me in those interviews is included in the book, so it has a, a, you know, a real message for the people sitting in this room. I also, uh, as I said, I talked to, to individuals from the National Grocers Association and the uh, NCPA, the National Community Pharmacists Association, and I included interviews from them also. As I wrote the book, in the back of the book, what's interesting about it is I put together a self-assessment inventory for business operators so that you can sit down in, in a, at a quiet time, if there's such a thing in your business, and go through a 200-point survey of whether you're poised properly to compete, survive, and thrive in a Walmart world. I also had the chance recently, I talked to Dan Gilligan, who is the president of PMAA, and Dan gave me some nice insights into the issues of gasoline and convenience stores today. And in July of this year, I spoke at the Mississippi, Mississippi Petroleum Marketers and Convenience Store Association. Say that fast a couple of times. And I was, uh, is, is Jerry Wilkerson here by chance? I don't know if Jerry's here. But uh, anybody from that meeting in Mississippi? I don't see any hands. In uh, April of 2005, I'll be again speaking at the Louisiana Oil Marketers and Convenience Store Association in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana at the Cajun Dome. And so what's happening is I'm, I'm gaining some contacts within the, in the convenience store industry, and I'm, I'm getting, in fact, I'm learning more every day about the competition that you have with the big boxes. I took an outside-in approach when I wrote the book. I thought about what can you use to be successful as a competitor. And one of the things I found across all of the businesses, whether it's pharmacies, grocery, or it's convenience stores, is you've got to find a niche or a pocket within which to compete. And I came up with this acronym, POCKETS. And I, it was like almost like I had divine intervention the day that it came to me. And then I, I came up with the, the, uh, the following to match up with the letters of the acronym, PRICE, operations, culture, key item promotion, expenses, talent, and service. 
And then what I did is I crafted a chapter on each of these areas and I talk about the strategies and tactics of, uh, of, of, of why it's difficult to compete with Walmart and survive. But then I also talk about how to compete knowing that information out there in, in the real world. As I stand here today, I can tell you it would have been much easier just to write a book that just talked about why it's hard to compete with Walmart. But I think that how many of you could help me write that book about why it's difficult? Because it really is difficult out there. Uh, the harder part of that message is how to do it. And let me ask you a question. How many of you are in direct competition with a big box retailer today where they have added gasoline to their, their parking lots uh, recently? Or I'd say about uh, 40 percent, 45 percent. The other uh, 50 to 55 percent that didn't have their hands raised, if there aren't gasoline pumps at those big box retailers today, you have to bet that they're coming because they figured out that that gasoline offer is a great way to be one-stop shopping for their customers. Before the meeting this morning, I was talking to some of the, the folks that are in the room here, and I was asking them about uh, what Walmart has done as it's come into, into their neighborhoods and into their area of the country. And I heard a story about a small town and how numbers of businesses had gone out of business when Walmart was coming in. And interestingly enough, some of those businesses went out of business before the Supercenter opened. And that bothered me as I did my research for the book because what I found out was there were a lot of competitors out there who just said, you know, they said, well, if they add gasoline pumps over there, I'm just going to go ahead and shut my doors and go out of business. And there's probably some people in this room that are feeling that way. When that day comes, I may just go ahead and just go out of business without a fight. And I'm going to share some inspirational words for you, and it's for those people that are thinking that way right now. Because I want you to think about this as you're thinking about whether you're going to go on and compete or not. It goes like this. If you think you're beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you'd like to win, but you think you can't, it's almost a cinch you won't. If you think you'll lose, you've lost. For out in the world we find, success begins with a person's will. It's all in a state of mind. If you think you're outclassed, you are. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win the prize. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger woman or man. But sooner or later, he or she who wins is the one who thinks they can. And you know, the lesson from that is this. As you're out there trying to compete and as the competition gets tougher, if you think you can, you probably can compete. And if you think you can't, you probably can't compete. So in either case, you're right. The starting point I found as I did my research for this project was this. You have to believe that you can compete, survive, and thrive in a Walmart world as a starting point, or you'll be one of those businesses that closes your doors. And it's my goal with this presentation on Pockets to give you some tools that you can use when you go back to make you better able and, and to become a more fit competitor. Interestingly enough, when I did my research, I came up with all kinds of interesting names that people call Walmart. And I would ask for uh, other uh, examples here this morning, but I don't think I will because I'm going to bet that some of you have some pretty interesting names that you call Walmart. But here's some of the names. Godzilla Mart, Wally World, the 800-pound gorilla, Weed Mart, the evil empire, Merchant of Shame, World Mart, the Giant, Big Brother Wally, and the Bentonville Colossus. And I also found in my research that uh, even in these small towns where they have uh, a zoning group that's fighting the introduction of a Walmart, there's another group that's always interested in the Walmart coming to town. It's, it's a lot of the consumers. So what, what happens when these big boxes are talking about coming into communities, 
they sort of divide the community on lines of uh, business versus consumer. And, and we all know of examples of where the communities have successfully fought a Walmart coming to town recently, Englewood, California being the best example. And we talked about that this morning with one of the groups that was planning a zoning uh, uh, in their community to not allow big box expansions of, of 100,000 square feet or greater in their community. And I said, well, are you aware of Walmart's new strategy? Are you aware of the Urban 99 strategy for a super center? And I said, you may want to take that back to your zoning commission because that will probably be the strategy they'll use if you zone them out at 100. They'll just build a 99,000 square foot super center. Or they won't expand the discount center. They'll go ahead and open up down the road a 40 to 55,000 square foot neighborhood market. So love them or hate them, Walmart is here to stay and they're continuing to expand at a rapid rate. Let me give you some big facts about the company. Every day of the year in 2004, Walmart will open a store somewhere in the world. That's 365 stores in a year. And just to think about it in, in, in terms of the amount of retail space that is, it's, it's a, an unbelievable aggressive expansion strategy. And my understanding is next year it's even more aggressive than that. It may be in, in the 500 range of stores that they're going to open around the planet. The company today has 1.4 million employees, or what they call associates, uh, around the uh, world. Each and every week in America, 130 million customers cross the thresholds of Walmart. And if you've ever uh, stood outside of a Walmart store, the vast majority of them are walking out with uh, shopping carts or bags full of merchandise. And Walmart is a Fortune 1 company with sales of $260 billion. They, they say that Walmart in the next five years will be a $500 billion company. And it's possible by 2015, if their current growth trends continue and their expansion continues, which it can, by the way, because international business in Walmart only represents 16% of their total sales right now, and they, they're only in 10 countries. It's estimated that they will be a trillion dollar company with a T. And should that happen, Walmart will then be pocketing one out of every seven dollars of retail spent across the planet Earth. So now that I have uh, brought everybody down thinking about those staggering numbers, let me try to talk to you about some ideas that we can use to help your businesses to compete, survive, and thrive. And we're going to start with price. If you have the best people and the best service and the friendliest folks, you don't have to have the best price. This quote is from a uh, convenience store executive. And the good news is for convenience stores on price is historically, if you go back 10 years ago, convenience stores didn't really view Walmart as competition at all because they didn't have gasoline. And your customer has a different expectation when they come into a convenience store than that customer that goes into a Walmart store. That Walmart customer, of course, is stocking their home shelves. The convenience store customer is that on-the-go customer that is going to be purchasing for uh, while they're on the go out, in, out in, uh, at work or out in the community. So fortunately, you haven't had the kind of price pressure on products up to this point in-store that you're now experiencing at the gasoline pumps with that competition. I'll tell you a, a, an insight that I, I gained when I was at the Walmart headquarters, and it involved everyday low prices. And Stone Phillips, you all know Stone Phillips, the, uh, the interviewer from, uh, from, from television, he did a news expose story on child labor in Walmart. And what was interesting, he came up to Bentonville, Arkansas while I was there, and he interviewed David Glass, the then president of uh, Walmart. And it was interesting that the Walmart executives, this is a, a strange insight, they did, they did not rehearse anything. They wouldn't rehearse a shareholders meeting. They wouldn't rehearse employee meetings. They didn't rehearse uh, news interviews. They refused to. They, they took a position that they were just going to state the facts and let the, let the facts speak for themselves. And there isn't a Fortune 500 company 
in America that would allow their top executives to get in front of a news expose show without probably uh, two to three months of preparation and knowledge of what the interview questions are, not Walmart. So Stone Phillips puts a TV set with a VCR in the bottom of it in front of David Glass, slides in that uh, videotape, and popping up on the screen is a child in a third world country manufacturing a shirt. He uh, finishes the video and he turns to David, and you know how they do the camera? They prod it right in on his face. You could see the beads of sweat on his forehead. And they said, David Glass, what's Walmart's position on child labor? And David was actually cool as a cucumber. He said, our position is that we don't only manufacture garments in third world countries with child labor. That was the end of his, uh, of his dissertation, if you will. And then Stone Phillips went out and he interviewed members of the U.S. public and did the man or woman on the street interviews. And he asked them, what do you think about this video? Take a look at this. Isn't this appalling? And to a person, the American public thought that was appalling that a child was over there manufacturing garments. And then he asked the next question. Would you be willing to buy that garment if it was manufactured in America for four to five dollars more per unit at the same quality? And the startling fact was to a person, they said, no. I would prefer to buy the garment at the everyday low price that Walmart offers it from a third world country. And so it seems the American public is more concerned with everyday low prices than they are with some perceived problem in a third world country. And that's part of the problem that you're up against in the convenience store industry with gasoline. Dan Gilligan told me, that the president of PMAA, that if you can keep your gasoline within about four cents of your competitors, no matter what corner you're on, and you provide knock your socks off customer service, it's likely you'll keep your customers. But when that number creeps to five cents, six cents, or more, customer loyalty starts to dissolve as they head down the block to go to your competitor to make the purchase. And as I say that, I'm not suggesting that you can go toe to toe if the price of gasoline that's being offered at a big box retailer is uh, below your cost of five cents, six cents, ten cents a gallon. That might be insane. You might be just uh, driving yourself out of business. But those are some of the realities you're up against with the American public. And their loyalty just goes out the window when it comes to pulling out their, uh, their wallet and buying at the uh, checkout counter. This slide is, uh, is, is a good one. Can you match Walmart's price for gasoline and still count on gasoline to drive your store's profitability? What I've heard is that you, you need to count on your gasoline to bring traffic, and you've got to, uh, to, to do your business on your inside offer. And I say this to retailers, and I'm going to say it to you. If you think that you can compete with Walmart on price on the same products, I want you to assume the position. Okay, I want you to reach back with your hand and I want you to pop yourself off the back of the skull and knock that thought out of your brain. Because the first time you think that you can compete with these big box retailers on price on the same product, you can't do it. You don't have the economies of scale that they do. You don't have the buying power that they do. You don't have the expense control structure. You don't have the, the synergies of economies of scale and distribution that they have. Don't go there. Don't try to compete that way. That's just not going to work for you. So what is going to work? When I wrote my book, I originally called it Picking Walmart's Pockets, by the way, and my publisher changed the name of the book to what I learned from Sam Walton. So I wrote a slide called Picking Sam Walton's Pockets. And here's a pricing idea for you. Don't try to compete with big box retailers on the same products at comparable prices Rely on your inside offer for profitability and your gasoline for traffic. And that's, what you, that's just plain and simple what you have to do. And that, so it makes your customer service and your store operations all the more important inside. And I wish we had more time to dwell on each and every one of these items because we could talk all day long about just the pricing strategies alone. On to operations. The key to operations at Walmart is their ability to maintain the highest standards while at the same time getting lockstep execution from their people. 
the Sam's Club organization, which is a division of Walmart, had a, uh, a ritual that they would use with their store associates. And this ritual involved a pseudo-American Indian word called Hetkati. And there's a real good lesson that all of us in this room can learn from this pseudo-American Indian word. And they had a Hetkati song, and they had a Hetkati dance. And I'm going to bring somebody up right now to do the song and dance with me. Anybody want to? No. We won't do that this morning. But they did a song and dance. It was a ritual about the acronym, which stands for High Expectations Are the Key to Everything. And what they did with their, and what they do with their 1.4 million employees is they focus them culturally on high expectations. They, they're a very, very demanding company on their people. And, uh, it, it, and I'll share with you in a little while some of the demands they make on management also. But the way that they do that as a beginning point is they set very high expectations for everything that they do. And they, they have standards of continuous learning and continuous improvement. And they have stretch goals that they set for everybody. And they're one of the best at communicating their high expectations are the key to everything. They have pillars of total quality that they teach in the Walton Institute. In Bentonville, Arkansas, or just south of Bentonville, Arkansas, is a town called uh, Fayetteville. And in Fayetteville, at the University of Arkansas, they have the Walton Institute. The Walton Institute teaches management principles and cultural, it does a cultural indoctrination 52 weeks a year. And often they'll run two classes at a time, and these classes will include as many as 50 people in one class. So there could be 100 people, managers a week, going through training. So they're committed. And, and you know the reputation of Walmart and Sam Walton. They're cheap as a day is long. They're not going to spend money to, to fly people around the country to go to Fayetteville, Arkansas, for a week of immersion training unless there's some benefit that comes out of it. So what they do is they bring all of their department managers, assistant managers, store managers, all the distribution center management team, all the headquarters management team, and they, they blend people together for a week of training. Now, when I say a week of training, I, I will say this. The week of training includes Sunday night through Saturday morning. They actually leave their home Sunday morning to get to, uh, to a meeting in the afternoon on Sunday, and they go to Saturday. So it's almost, it's, it's, it's six and a half full days of immersion training on culture. And they teach things like continuous improvement, productivity, quality, and service. And they set standards for their management team. And the managers are then responsible by using rituals like Hetkati to teach those standards to the associates. In the area of operations, when you're trying to pick Walmart's pockets and Sam Walton's pockets, here's an idea for you. Work to continuously improve every area of your operation, especially customer service and being in stock. If you wait till Walmart's coming to town, and, and I think most of you have Walmart in the community, or if you wait till that big box retailer gets aggressive in your community, to start to service your customers is too late. By definition, good merchants should be servicing their customers today. And I noticed this with the grocery store chains, too. All of a sudden, they're opening a super center, and the grocery store is starting to teach their employees to provide better service. And, you know, it's like, eh, too late, waited too long. So now what's happened is to add insult to injury, you're, if, you're, uh, if you are a grocery store that has prices that are higher than a super center, and you weren't servicing your customers before, you expect them to stay with you when now they have the option for everyday low prices. It's, it's the same example here. Your customers will stay with you. You're, you're, there are loyal customers that each and every one of you have that will stay with you, but you should be nurturing those relationships day in and day out. That customer is a boss. You need them more than they need you. Culture. Sam said, take care of your people. Your people will take care of the customer, and the business will take care of itself. I heard it said at Sears another way. The, the Sears department store said, employee attitudes affect customer attitudes affect store results. Okay? So if your people are on the field, and they're not feeling good about themselves today, 
or they, uh, they, they're not positive in their dealings with the customers. I don't know about you, but when I get treated that way, when I go into some retail store, I don't necessarily ever want to come back. You don't have a right in retail to have an off day. Every day is, is game day in retail, and you've got to be... You have to be on at all times as those customers cross your thresh threshold. Now, what can you do? You've got to figure out what can I do to take care of my people in that relationship as business leaders, as business uh, managers, as business owners. What can I do to make sure that I create an environment where the folks that work for my organization feel good about working here and they understand it's important to be upbeat and positive when they cross the threshold? So, it, when you walk into a store and you see a bad attitude in any store, I don't think bad employee. I think that there's a leadership issue where it hasn't been communicated as a standard. So take a step back and as you walk into your store, think about if I was a customer walking in here for the first time, what kind of experience am I going to have coming into my own location? And that's a, that's a great acid test for you. In the Walmart headquarters in the executive row, and by the way, the Walmart headquarters is a converted warehouse. It's probably about a, a $20 a square foot uh, building finished out. It's an old distribution center. The Kmart headquarters up in Troy, Michigan is uh, Taj Mahal in comparison and probably has it's probably $300 a square foot. And in this hallway on the, on the paneled wall is, is this plaque called Lions or Gazelles. And let me share the words with you that are on that plaque because this is what the Walmart leaders are looking at as they're walking up and down the hall to visit each other in their offices. Lions or gazelles. Every day in Africa, a gazelle wakes up knowing it must outrun the fastest lion or it'll die. Each day, a lion wakes up knowing it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it'll starve to death. You know, it really doesn't matter whether you're a lion or a gazelle. When that sun comes up, you'd better be running. And you know, I, I, when I read those words on the wall, I was standing there waiting to get in to see one of the executives one day, and I thought, wow, that's a, that's a pretty smash-face competitive statement to make. It says it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there in retailing, and, and you're either going to be, uh, you're going to be eaten or you're going, to be, uh, you're going to be eating somebody else up. And in Walmart's case, they're, uh, they're going to be the aggressor. And so the point is, as every day is game day, you've got to go out in the field every day and you've got to hit the ground running and try to continuously make your operation better and make your business better because that's exactly what they're doing. Walmart's key management competencies, and by the way, uh, everything that's in my presentation is in my book, so we don't have this huge handout that you uh, need today. You can get it in the book. The things like these management competencies, and there's, there's two areas of leadership competencies at, uh, at Walmart. They're called people skills and work processes. And then the list of skills that individuals could have in any company, trust me, there's probably a hundred things that you could select as being the key leadership competencies for a company. And as you look at these, these may or may not be the ones that you need for your organization. Don't just assume that these are right for you because there's a process you go through to develop this list. But this was put together with the executives of Walmart. And in fact, I know that because I worked with them to put this list together. And what we did is we identified these people, skills, and work processes, and we said, if our leaders will develop capability in these areas, we'll win at retail. And so these were the competencies we used. We integrated into our recruiting processes, into the people we actually hired, into our orientation, into training, into performance appraisal, and into promotion. We actually designed a self-developed 360-degree review of our managers on these competencies. 360-degree meaning the employees reporting to the individual gave input, and the people above the individual gave input on these competencies. A Walmart leader, a Walmart manager, has to be balanced in the way they approach the business. You can't just get sales. You can't just get your comp store sales number and succeed at Walmart. You also have to succeed with people. 
Now, on the flip side, you can succeed with people and not get your numbers, and you're in a world of hurt, too. You've got to balance that act. And you show me a long-term manager at Walmart that runs a store that has been there for, for many, many years, and, and you're probably looking at an individual that has figured out that delicate balancing act of profitability in people. Because, as I said before, take care of your people, your people will take care of the customer, and the business will take care of itself. The cultural idea for you is this. Communicate standards and provide employees with regular feedback, reward performance, and deal with non-performers. The reason why you have to deal with non-performers is because you've got to give your good performers a reason to run. Because everybody in every work group there ever was knows who the poor performers are, and they're watching what their supervisor is doing to deal with it. Key item promotion and product. Find your niche and buy product to create a merchandise mix and services which clearly differentiates your business. I got this from uh, Retail Merchandiser Magazine. It says, Walmart may still enter the convenience store business and in the process could reinvent convenience store retailing as we know it. They've already experimented with convenience stores. They've already got that sitting there waiting as another strategy. I just don't think they have time to, to, uh, to, to worry about it right now. What Walmart does is when they do the research and development for new strategies, unlike most companies that use a strategy of think big, start small, scale up, what Walmart does is they think small, start small, and scale up. So they've already done their R&D work on the convenience store strategy. And it, last time I looked at those parking lots, out there at the Sam's Clubs and the Walmarts, they seem to have enough space to drop a 3,000 square foot box or a 4,000 square foot box. If you're Walmart, your convenience store will probably be 7,500 square feet. But they, they have a strategy for convenience stores. They just haven't put it out there yet. An expansion. World expansion, they're only in 16% of, the, uh, uh, of their sales are international. But what's interesting is domestically, because of the rural retailing strategy, Walmart only has super centers in 33% of the top 100 metropolitan markets, and that's where 70 cents of every USA food retailing dollar is spent. Said another way, they have 70% of, the, of the, the major metro market available to them going forward. So don't think that their only expansion opportunities are internationally. And here is the neighborhood market, that what they call a small mart. And this particular store, I believe, was in, it's in Dallas, Texas. I went down there and, and got a chance to see this store. It was in a real estate restricted area where they had a discount center on one side of the freeway with no room for expansion. So within 200 yards of the, of the discount store, they plopped the neighborhood market, which is a 42,000 to 55,000 square foot store. And in that store, they actually have a store within a store, which is a convenience store. It's called a grab it and go. And it has many of the services that you offer, and it even has an honor bar system for, for coffee and pastry and newspapers where you just you get it and go. And I thought that was kind of interesting. So they're still playing with this concept of convenience. The idea that I, I'll give you on picking Sam Walton's pocket here is form vendor partnerships. That's what Walmart does. Shop your competition. Differentiate your products to provide services that appeal to local customers. Your advantage is the fact that you are a local citizen, that you are a local retailer. You have your finger more on the pulse of what that consumer needs. You also have the ability as a merchant to do a better job of getting to know your customers than Walmart could ever think of. And on to expense control. Sam's philosophy was every time we spend a dollar foolishly, we're taking a dollar out of our customers' pockets. Because every time they had a chance to cut expenses, this is a double whammy of, of Walmart's buying power. They go out there and they negotiate with this incredible economy of scale they have, but then they back it up by cutting expenses behind and they pass the expense savings back along to the customer to reduce costs. And these are some of the things that they do culturally, and I'm not going to go through these in detail, but when I was at the headquarters, we added 100 stores one year across the country. And if you think in terms of about 700 employees per store, 
at uh, 100 stores, when well, you do the math, that's a lot. That's a lot of people. So, the how many additional headcount do you think I got to support the stores when they added 100 stores at the headquarters? How many how many people do you think I got to help support the employees? Well, you probably guessed it. I got zero. Because you know what the standard was for my budget for overtime? Zero. Do you know what the standard was for additional headcount? Zero. Do you know what I was told when I said, how do I get additional headcount? They said, we'll give you additional headcount when the pig squeals. I said, I'll get additional headcount when the pig squeals? Well, where is this dang pig? I'll get him to squeal right now. I'll be the pig that squeals. But that was a standard, no overtime. And I'll challenge you with that. If you think about a company like Walmart has no overtime, then how do they get the work done? The managers get very efficient at, at uh, working with people to create high expectations and high standards. Because guess who does the work when the hourly employees go home? The managers. And those managers are, are known for working 70, 80, 90 hours a week and that's not a stranger to you. I know you, you work a lot of hours also. They manage their payroll schedules to match the volume in the stores with technology. They have a company-owned fleet of trucks and trailers, and they backhaul, and they use, they, they use cross-docking in their distribution centers to manage inventory costs. A technology example that I think is one that just blows me away is the fact that the, that the climate control, the heat and air conditioning in every store in the company is centrally controlled in Bentonville, Arkansas. They can't even control their own thermostat at the store. That's how important cost savings are. And employee ownership, when I was at the headquarters, believe it or not, the employees that worked in my department at the headquarters would bring their own office supplies from home to, for company use. They brought their own staplers, staples, pencils, pens, paper, rubber bands, they did everything they could to lower company costs. And they did it for a reason. They did it because Walmart had a profit sharing program and they felt that this could be their contribution to profit sharing. And the day I moved into my office in the headquarters at Walmart, I said, what am I gonna do for furniture? What am I gonna do for an office? They sent me down to the vendor supply room to get vendor samples. And that's how I outfitted my office. That's a true story. An idea for you on expense control is adjust work schedules to match your sales volume, eliminate overtime wherever you can because your costs just went up 50% when people are working overtime, and teach employees to take ownership of reducing waste and controlling expenses in every area that they can. If there's only one lesson you take from my talk today, as leaders become fanatical about expense control. Because in the competition with big box retailers, it's one of the more controllable areas you have within your business is to control your own expenses. And, and in, in the offices at Walmart, there's an idea for you you can use. We cut our paper cost by 50% by using the back of every sheet of paper in that home office. And you would often get a, a, get a memo or an email with an X through one side and a new note that had been run through a printer on the other side. And theoretically, that reduces your paper cost by 50%. Now, it may sound foolish to you, but if you think about it this way, if you have 1.4 million people all moving paper around today, wouldn't it be great if you could reduce your paper costs by 50%? And they, they sweat the details. They squeeze that nickel till the buffalo bellows. And talent. Walmart hires average people, and their secret is they get above average performance. And many competitors go out and they find high-powered, uh, the best people in the market. And unfortunately, when you measure their performance, the companies are ending up getting average performance from above-average people. And the problem with that is you tend to pay a premium for wages for better people. What Walmart does is they hire average people, and they, they hire some people that might even be considered below average. But the secret is, is that they set standards and they get above average performance from average people. So they get more from less. Other companies have a tendency to get less from more. And so there's a challenge for you there. I'm not telling you to go out and change your hiring practices. 
I, I think it's a good idea to hire the best people you can find. But just make sure you're getting above average uh, performance from those great people that you're hiring. What Walmart did is they, uh, out of necessity, they hired people off the farms from uh, Oklahoma, from Kansas, from southern Missouri, and from uh, northwest Arkansas because there's an area called Four Corners, and literally the home office is full of people from four different states. Now, historically, Walmart wasn't a retail mecca. Today it is. Everybody goes, to, goes through Bentonville these days if they're on the supplier side. But what Walmart did is they built their company by getting people off the farms that were used to working 120-hour work weeks on the farm, and then they cut their hours and only make them work 80 hours at Walmart. So they actually got a, an easier job going to the Walmart headquarters. They also promoted from within, and Sam had a saying, it was called picking them green. And what he would do is he would pick the, the people from within, and he would uh, uh, put people into jobs that didn't have the prerequisite skills. Now, you got to remember, I just told you, I, I, I worked for PepsiCo. I was with the Frito-Lay division of, in Dallas. And like many Fortune 500 companies, we wouldn't put somebody into a job unless they had five to seven years of prerequisite experience, were a 75th to 90th percentile individual, and they had sparks coming out there, you know what? We, would, we, wouldn't even, we wouldn't even consider them for hire. And then I go to Walmart, and they're promoting somebody from within with no prerequisite experience. And I saw it happen there over and over and over again. And it worked. It challenged my, my beliefs about staffing. I never believed that you could do that until I saw it happen. The difference at Walmart is they have a, a, a team infrastructure where people support one another and help each other to succeed, and they fill in the gaps. And what I also found out was that any individual at Walmart really isn't going to make that big an impact if they leave because the other employees will pull together to fill in the void if a job is open. But over and over and over again, I saw average people being put into jobs with no prerequisite experience, and they were succeeding beautifully. And Walmart was the only company I ever saw where a demotion was not a badge of dishonor. There were many people, they highlighted them in the culture that had been promoted and then demoted. And then they'd get promoted again and again and demoted again. And whenever somebody was demoted, they simply attributed the fact that they had been picked green. And nobody held it against them. And so people were given an opportunity until still to this day are given opportunities at the Walmart headquarters that very few Fortune 500 companies in America would give those individuals and what they do is out of sheer enthusiasm and they, and they hire for attitude, they fill in the gap on performance. And to be honest with you, Walmart, in many ways, doesn't like the baggage that professionals from, uh, from outside the company bring to the company. They would prefer to train people in the Walmart way. And I do remember when I went into the headquarters, I had to get re-educated. And, and I had to back up and change the way I approach things because professionals from companies like I, I, my background, we were, we were used to taking uh, projects and making them overly complicated. At Walmart, they simplify everything. So what I had to learn was how to take my complicated ideas and distill them down to simple ideas that could be easily understood and more so than being easily understood, could be easily executed in the stores. And teamwork and synergy. Walmart has a, a standard of, 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 of and it is uh, called servant leadership. Sam used to stand on a stage not unlike this one, and he would talk to the 500 top managers of the company at the Saturday morning meeting, and often he would talk about servant leadership. And as a leader, what that said was, as a leader, it's your job to support the people that, that are working with you, not even reporting to you. They work with you. And... They called the employees associates because they want associates to be business partners in Walmart. And they mean it. It's not just, just, uh, just words on paper. People are considered associates. And the managers are considered coaches. And they want them to work together. And one of the great secrets of teamwork, if I asked all of you, do you have a good team of people working in your company, almost every one of you would raise your hand. But at Walmart, the key to teamwork isn't just a group of people working together. The key is team synergy. And what they do is they truly take a group of individuals, and if you added up the performance of those individuals individually, 
they wouldn't add up to the synergy. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts at Walmart. And what they do is they have figured out, they get people working together through using servant leadership, and there are prerequisite steps for creating synergy, which are creating caring between and amongst people, managers and employees or associates, creating trust between people, which gives you the opportunity now to develop teamwork, and out of that servant leadership component is the magical team, team synergy that can, that can uh, be produced. And that's one of the things that they do that, as I explain it to you here today, it's it, conceptually, it's easy to understand that I want team synergy. It's very difficult to accomplish that, to get people to work together. Because you see, individual contribution at Walmart is downplayed. And, and the performance of teams is rewarded and talked about. Anyone who is an egotistical prima donna at Walmart isn't going to succeed. You have to be able to work in teams, and team performance is more important than individual performance. If I were going to give you a suggestion, I'd say hire for attitude. Provide ongoing training and hold employees accountable to aggressive goals. Hire people that are, that are for attitude. And the reason that Walmart's able to pull it off, and the only reason you'll be able to pull it off, you have to train them. You have to set standards. And if you haven't done this before, you can start today. You can say, today is the day I'm going to start, and we're going to hire people. And by, my, you know, People are going to be positive that work in this business from this point onward. And I'll take the responsibility as a leader that if it wasn't there before, but from this day forward, we are going to be the, the, provide the best customer service that's out there to our consumer because they deserve it. And change the standards. And, and admit that you haven't had those standards historically, if that's what it takes. But change the standards and hire great people, hire people who are better than you are, and set very high standards. And people very rarely will disappoint you by not being able to achieve lofty standards. People want to be challenged. And service. Walmart's internal customer service standards, they reminded me of that saying from the Three Musketeers, it's all for one and one for all. Walmart has the same standard for internal customer service, the service that's received between and amongst departments and employees, as they have for the external customer crossing the threshold. If you ask somebody at the Walmart headquarters for help, if I went to another function of the company and asked them for the help, they would say, what do you need, when do you need it, and how many do you need? And they would do it for me. I wouldn't hear a litany of, uh, of excuses or hear about their labor pains. The internal customer service standards in that company are out of this world and are one of the great secrets of the company. And many companies have two different standards for service. We treat our external customers extremely well, and we treat each other within our own company kind of so-so. And that wasn't the case and is not the case at Walmart. Every associate at Walmart is a merchant. I was a merchant. If someone said to me, what do you do for the company? I'm a retailer. I'm a merchant. Every accounting manager was a merchant. Every IT manager was a merchant. The real estate department people were merchants. We sat in on product meetings on Saturday morning and picked product. Everybody in your business is a merchant. Everyone has to be focused on that external customer. That's what the name of the game is, and Walmart did that better than anybody else. And if you ask someone for Walmart what they, what they do for a living, they'll tell you they're a retailer, and then you'll say, well, Lenny, what's your job? And then they'll tell you what their job is, because they're a retailer first, and whatever they do for the company second, and your employees should be the same. Empower your employees to solve customer-related problems on the spot. They don't need to go to some manager somewhere. They don't need to call the customer back. They don't need to... You know, I'll check on it and get back to you. Give them the authority and the responsibility to solve problems now. It's too fast out there. Service is, a, is now. Sam said, 99.9% .9 of customers are honest and fair in their dealings. Don't design your policies for that one-tenth of one percent who are not. And that's the way they design their, 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 their uh, customer service. They ask that customer, what would you like us to do? And then they just do it. You'd like, me, you'd like to exchange that? Go ahead. You'd like your money back? Here it is. What would you like us to do and then just do it? That's a pretty high standard of service. 
Also, teach your associates features and benefits of your products. Teach them suggestive add-on selling. Uh, and get close to your customers would be the things under service. I wish we had all day to talk about the elements of pockets, of price operations, culture, key item promotion, expenses, talent, and service. But we don't. And I think that these are the, the, the seven areas that pretty much capture what you're up against with Walmart. And I, I, in my book, I disclose the strategies and tactics I believe they use. Uh, but as you saw today, I'm a storyteller, and that's exactly the way I fleshed out my book with great stories. And as we close, I want to I want to ask you to do something, and it's when you're out there competing in a Walmart world, don't quit, because the temptation is to say that I can't do it, we're not going to make it. Step back, put a strategy together, and have a plan of action of what you're going to do. I'll tell you an inspirational story about quitting, and I want you to remember this when you're thinking about the hard times in your business, because this happened to me personally. My wife, Cheryl, had a stroke last year in July of 2003. Very young, had a stroke. She survived the stroke. And in those days that followed the stroke, she was hospitalized. And I went to visit her all the time. And when she finally came out of the, uh, the semi-comatose state you have initially in a stroke, and she started to recover, we started to talk. And I watched her, and, and she was so inspirational in the way that she was now in a position of having been fully capable of doing everything she needed to do in her life, and now she was going to have to deal with paralysis of her good side, the right side, and she was going to have to go through physical therapy. So I said to her, I said, what are we going to do now? Because we, both of us had never been through this. And she said, I can tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to physical therapy for the next six weeks while I'm in the hospital from 8 to 5. Intensive uh, physical therapy. <laughs> Sunday through, uh, through Saturday. Seven days a week for the next six weeks. And she said, I'm going to tell you what I want you to do. She said, I want you to go home and I want you to write that book that you've always talked about. She said, you've talked about writing that book for 10 years. She said, I'm going to be in therapy from 8 to 5. I want you to go home, get on your computer, and start writing that book. So, you know, I, I went back home, and then I would go in to visit her in the evenings. And I sat down at the computer, and at a time in my life when I shouldn't have had any focus whatsoever, I, for the first time in my life in writing, had more focus than I've ever had before. It was, it was unbelievable. I don't know if it was divine intervention or what it was, but I had to focus. And in July of 2003, I started to write. I wrote 100,000 words by uh, the 1st of January of 2004, sold the book to one of the biggest publishers in the world, and the book went into the bookstores in August of 2004. It's an incredible uh, accomplishment in, in book publishing to get a book turned around that quickly and into the stores. And I did it as a result of the inspiration I got from my wife. So I want to share with you one last thought that's inspirational as you're thinking about the challenges that you have in front of you, and it's called Don't Quit. It goes like this. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the path you're walking seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile but you seem to sigh, when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life seems strange with its twists and turns, yet every one of us eventually learns that many a failure would turn about, and we could have won had we stuck it out. Don't give up, though your pace seems slow. You might succeed with just one more blow. Often the goal is much nearer than it might seem to the faltering woman or man. You see, often the victor is given up when they might have captured the winner's cup to later learn as the night slips down how close they were to the winner's crown. Success is failure turned inside out. It's the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when you're the hardest hit. National Association of Convenience Stores member, don't give up, don't ever quit.